Dear colleagues, uh, we are about to start. Uh, we are waiting for the last people to connect online and we are starting the session. Um, let me first uh, introduce quickly uh, the topic and the, obviously the speakers of that session and uh, we will dig in uh, quite quickly. So, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello everyone and welcome to the workshop Bringing the Gaps for a Safer Cyberspace. I am Lucien Castex. I am the representative for public policy of AFNIC, the French CCTLD, and I will be moderating this session. A colleague online, Denaya Denis, from the South Sudan IGF, will be moderating online, and will also be collecting questions along with Anya Ganjo from IGF Secretariat. I invite the virtual participants to ask questions on Zoom, and we'll we will have a Q&A session as well after the stage setting. So as you know, our topic today is cybersecurity, bridging the gaps for a safer cyberspace, which is, let's be honest, a quite broad topic. It can be analyzed from a global resilience perspective when talking, for example, about infrastructures or awareness strategies and it can also be tackled from a regulatory angle. Balancing rights from trying to ensure a safer cyberspace while preserving human rights and fundamental freedom, such as privacy, data protection, freedom of speech. Regulation as well, government addressing cybersecurity, which wide lens, fighting cybercrime and anticipating new challenging for example, new cyber threats, as many as they are, AI, chatbots, and so on. Combating hate speech and disinformation while protecting digital freedoms. Ignorantia juris non excusat. The ignorance of the law does not allow one to escape liability, one should say. Protecting critical infrastructure is also quite a topic as well as the integrity, for example, of elections to avoid interferences. There is also a need to build capacity and integrate cybersecurity in curriculums, schools, obviously universities, lifelong education. In that mix, what should be the role of regional and international instruments? And basically reflecting on the title of the session, how to bridge the gap to foster a safer cyberspace for all. But enough, enough talking. These NRI sessions are at the heart of the IGF, allowing for an exchange of ideas to facilitate knowledge sharing, collaboration, and first and foremost, learning from diverse perspectives to comprehend a global and multidimensional phenomenon. We have around the table, both on site here in Kyoto, Japan, and online, excellent experts, uh, bringing inputs from national and regional IGF throughout the world to help us grasp that complexity. So the flow of the session, really quickly, is the 30 minute stage setting. Then we will have open floor exchange. So I invite you uh, to reflect on what you want to ask, to discuss for that session, and then a 15-minute conclusive remark and voluntary commitment, if any, and we'll close the session. So around the table, we have first from Africa, uh, Mr. Eliamani Laltaika from the Tanzania AGF, a judge at the High Court of Tanzania. Uh, we have also from Europe, Giovanni Zani from the Italian IGF. Giovanni is the director of the Italian fact-checking project Pagella Politica and Facta News. We also have from the Grulac region and from Argentina, Ms. Veronica Ferrari. She is a global policy advocacy coordinator for the Association for Progressive Communication. From the MENA region, and it should be online, we have Mr. Mohamed Farahat, from the North African IGF, from Egypt. 
as an Egyptian lawyer and legal researcher on digital right and cybercrime, and the vice chairman of MAG of North African IGF. And lastly, from Asia Pacific, we have Dai Mochinaga, an associate professor at Sheshaba Institute of Technology here on site. So, with this excellent speaker, let me first uh, welcome them all, welcome you, and give the floor first to uh, my colleague from Africa, Mr. Eliamani Laltaika. You have the floor. Thank you very much. A uh, very good morning, uh, colleagues and uh, fellow uh, panelists. As I've been introduced, I come from Africa. And it's such a pleasure to talk about cybersecurity in October. Because as you all know, uh, since 2004, October was set as the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And throughout this month, leaders at all levels are supposed to raise awareness on uh, the topic of cybersecurity as it touches uh, various uh, aspects of life and uh, different demographies. And also in its uh, very, very cross-cutting nature. Some of you might have uh, traveled to Africa <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, might have seen the Maasai uh, heading their cattle in the same place with lions, actually. So you see a small boy uh, with nothing, no weapon, and lions are somewhere there, buffaloes. Has anyone seen something like that? Yes, I can see some people nodding that they have seen. Now, uh, how do they keep themselves secure? Can we learn something from the Maasai indigenous communities to assist us to uh, make our policies for cybersecurity better and more inclusive. Uh, later, during my closing, I'll take the liberty to give you our community or our ethnic, our indigenous people's secrets or code of how we can uh, walk in the park, in the Serengeti, uh, along lions and still keep ourselves uh, uh, secure. And uh, those five hints will assist you in uh, taking your cybersecurity uh, further. Uh, but for now, as I have uh, been tasked by the uh, uh, moderator, my task is to introduce the, uh, uh, the, the concept and then see how all of us are coming in. Cybersecurity is a topic that I'm passionate about, like I said, because before I was appointed a judge, I taught at uh, Nelson Mandela Institute of Science and Technology, and my subject was cybersecurity law. And uh, so I was halfway writing a book. Uh, then I left everything because I, <laughs> I got busy with judgments. And uh, I like this definition by the ITU, which is extremely broad on what cybersecurity is. Uh, to paraphrase it, cybersecurity are the tools and the processes aimed at making the cyberspace uh, safe for all. And these tools can be technological, uh, legal, ethical, economic, and even diplomatic tools. For example, if someone from a very big country big technologically, uh, hacks systems in a not so big country. You cannot flex your muscles. You need a diplomat to go and say, kindly assist us to make sure that our banks come back to operation because we have been hacked. So cybersecurity is moving from the computer science to many other aspects, to include school teachers, teaching their kids how to avoid cyberbullying. Sociologists teaching how you can avoid uh, losing your mind because you are being pulled right, uh, uh, left, and center in the internet. So cybersecurity is for everyone. Uh, cybersecurity law is kind of the center because 
law in this context is a management tool. And uh, when you talk about cybersecurity law, you include issues of data protection. You include issues of uh, privacy. You include issues of protecting intellectual property online. For example, avoiding counterfeits which are sold online. You include issues of electronic transactions and uh, uh, e-banking. And uh, finally, you include issues of fighting obscene, obscenity, uh, 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 issues of hate crime, and issues of uh, cyber uh, terrorism. To conclude my first part and allow my colleagues to come in, because I'm uh, aware that uh, they are going much, much uh, uh, deeper in uh, the cyber crime, which is a part of the cyber security law, uh, known by many because uh, many people want to enforce those uh, criminal aspects instead of uh, going broadly to facilitate. Cybersecurity may be divided into three layers. To have a comprehensive cybersecurity policy or law, you must cater for three layers. And these are one, hardware layer or hardware level. Two, protocol layer. Three, content layer. The hardware layer is the security of the infrastructure. You need to have infrastructure which is secure and which is resilient. You cannot deploy substandard uh, machines, laptops, and then expect it to be secure. So in Tanzania, for example, we have the Tanzania Communication Regulatory Authority which checks the standards of every gadget that is deployed or is imported into the country. Protocol layer is now the software that we use. Uh, you find that we have companies, I have uh, my colleague Jeannie uh, will probably chip in later to explain how a huge industry is dedicated into developing um, antivirus and uh, all these uh, 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 protection uh, 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 gears. And the, lastly is the content layer. Content layer is where you post things. Many people agree that as much as we promote freedom in the internet, we also need to make sure that it is not abused. So what goes into the internet in terms of the content should be respectful of uh, people and the dignity. Uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament, Sarah from Uganda, talked passionately yesterday about how, uh, you know, uh, bloggers and uh, users of the uh, uh, social media go uh, uh, invade privacy and spread lies and things like that. Uh, many judges are prepared to make sure that uh, 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 person, uh, 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 rights of uh, personality rights are respected. And by personality rights, this is uh, German terminology. Uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, German, France, Europe in general have a more comprehensive approach compared to Anglo American legal system, which does not have this very rich concept of, uh, of, of, of a privacy. Uh, in, if you see the GDPR is built upon this Germanic uh, French culture, which uh, has a much more deeper philosophy of respecting uh, uh, personalities rather than just uh, allow anyone to invade. With those uh, few remarks, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, dear colleague. Um, for that great presentation and for reminding us of the definition of cybersecurity by the ITU and as well of the need to bring together legal and policy aspects with technology as well as sociology or philosophy of the internet. I propose to give the floor to Mr. Giovanni Zani. Uh, Giovanni, you have the floor. Now it works, I think. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for the previous presenters and the moderator. The previous presentation was really, really useful in um, 
setting the frame for this discussion, and I think, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is already kind of a success because I've never been on such a big screen in my life. It's like being uh, at, the, at the movie theater with a movie of myself. And um, what I'm trying to, in, in the frame that was exposed before, I think that my, the, my few remarks will be squarely in the, on the content side because um, I, I'll be talking about cybersecurity in terms of the electoral process. And cybersecurity of the electoral process is a crucial part of today's democratic proceedings, as well as a recurring theme in the public debate. Uh, the next European Parliament election is scheduled to be held, held on 6 to 9 June 2024. According to many commentators, next year's election is going to be especially contentious and crucial for the political future of the Union. The numbers of this democratic exercise are massive. 27 states, with a population of roughly 450 million people, will be called to the polls in order to elect more than 700 representatives in the only directly elected body of the Union. Especially after 2016, the momentous year when British citizens voted to leave the European Union and Donald Trump was elected to the White House, there have been growing concerns about the risk posed by the public debate, po posed to the public debate by the issues of disinformation and the influence this can have on the electoral process. In the years since, many examples have emerged of coordinated campaigns and foreign interference by malicious actors with the aim of influencing the public opinion of states around the world, including Europe. The COVID-19 pandemic has given us a clear example of how this information can have a direct impact on public health, while the war in Ukraine has shown us how false and misleading information is one of the we weapons in, the, in a conflict, especially in the battle for winning over international hearts and minds that often runs in parallel with the one on the field. With this background, we can safely say that our public debate at the European level is not very healthy. And we know that one of the premises for free and fair election is a free and informed public debate. So free from external attacks, free from foreign interference, free as much as possible for information of bad quality. The experience I would like to present today is the one of the European Digital Media Observatory, also known as EDMO. EDMO is a project funded by the European Union that brings together a large community of researchers media literacy experts, journalists, policy experts, and fact checkers. Its governance is independent from public authorities, including the European Commission, and its ambitious scope is coordinating and promoting many activities in media and policy analysis, media and information literacy, as well as academic research around the issues of mis and disinformation. EDMO has established a network of European fact checkers who collaborate in transnational investigations and publish every month an overview of detected disinformation across the continent. In this context, at the beginning of this year, the European Media Observatory has decided to establish a task force ahead of the 2024 European elections. The idea is to monitor what happens in the EU information ecosystem ahead of the elections and highlight the risks connected with it. The task force wants to facilitate communications in research media and information literacy, as well as fact-checking initiatives. It wants to bridge the gap and exchange information also with other stakeholders, both public and private, that are monitoring the electoral efforts. In order to have a collective assessment of the risks posed to the security of the elections from the perspective of the media ecosystem, we need to identify both common trends that regard the whole union and critical challenges that involve maybe just one country. Every country and every region in Europe is exposed to different risks, and the ambition of the task force is to provide an overview of all that. For example, during a, rec a recent EDMO event a couple of weeks ago, we heard that the EDMO Spanish community did not detect a significant amount of disinformation originating from other countries during the parliamentary elections that took place in Spain at the end of July. On the contrary, in Central, Euro in Central Europe, for example, in Slovakia or in Czech Republic, this is very much an issue, 
and it is at the top of the list for the local EDMA representatives. I mention these regional differences because the task force gives from the beginning a strong responsibility to the EDMA chapters in the various regions and countries of Europe, the so-called EDMA hubs. There are currently 14 of them and they cover almost all the states, regions and linguistic communities in the Union. In fact, the task force is composed of one representative from each hub, plus three members from the advisory council, and it relies on them for collecting and sharing information about what they see on the ground. The task force builds on a similar previous experience that happened a couple of years ago, when the same ADMO uh, established a similar initiative at the beginning of the war in Ukraine. The first output of the current task force on the European elections will be hopefully a risk assessment report that tries to foresee what are the main areas of concern across the 27 states and 24 languages of the Union. To conclude, part of the strategy of the European Union ahead of next year's elections is to delegate at least part of its responsibilities for ensuring the security of the elections to a multi-stakeholder group of experts chaired by a fact-checker. The idea is to tackle the issue in a democratic and inclusive way, giving proper representation to the diversity of issues on the ground and at the same time avoiding any censorship of exercise or exercising repression. We hope that this experience can serve as, as, as a useful inspiration for future elections in Europe and beyond, especially in those places with a high degree of diversity and difference among geographical regions and communities. Thank you for your attention, and I welcome your questions and remarks in the following discussion. Thank you. Thank you a lot uh, for bringing light to the importance of election and of balancing uh, cybersecurity with fundamental freedoms. I propose to give the floor now to Veronica Ferrari uh, from the Grulac region. Veronica, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm glad to be here. Good morning. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation. And it's great to, to be here to discuss how to bridge the gaps for a safer cyberspace. Um, so for those who don't know the Association for Progressive Communications, the organization I work with, um, we're, we're an international civil society organization and a network of members from over 40 countries, mainly in the global south, uh, working on gender, social and environmental justice issues and the intersections with digital technologies. So in my intervention today, I wanted to talk briefly about the need to adopt gender perspectives to cybersecurity uh, to have a safer cyberspace uh, for everyone. Because we all know that traditionally cybersecurity debates have been centered on national security and the security of, of systems. Um, but we also see that is an increase consensus and attention about the need for a human rights-based approach to cybersecurity, since, as we argue from APC, humans are the ones impacted by cyber threats, incidents, and operations. Um, and also, there is more and more consensus in, in global, regional, and national spaces that different groups are in different positions when dealing with cybersecurity threats, such as surveillance, hacking, censorship, disinformation campaigns, data breaches, um, internet shutdowns, so some populations are more vulnerable than others. Um, so this is referred to as differential vulnerabilities. Um, and cyber incidents have shown to disproportionately impact and harm individuals and groups in society um, on the basis of their race, gender, sexual orientation, and also because of their profession, such as journalists and human rights uh, defenders, or people in other situations of vulnerability. So, as I was saying, at national, regional, and international cyber policy discussions, uh, we see these issues gaining more space, um, but also we are seeing policies that threaten the, the cybersecurity for all. Uh, for example, like some cyber crimes laws around the world that we mapped at, at, in research at APC that it, instead of protecting these vulnerable groups, could in fact threaten their, their human rights. Um, so, in terms of a of, of a regional perspective, so few countries have fully integrated gender considerations into their national cybersecurity policies. In Latin America, for example, it is still difficult to find explicit references to gender or gender equality um, in cyber policies and strategies. 
Um, some examples that I can think about is like Chile and, and Costa Rica with the new strategy they are discussing are, are some of the countries that have incorporated um, gender considerations in some way. And at the global level, at some, for example, UN discussions connected with cybersecurity, there is more consensus about the need to bridge the digital gender gap uh, to promote more diversity and, and women's participation in the cybersecurity field and also in cybersecurity policy, but still clear guidance on how to mainstream gender into cyber norms um, is still lacking. So I wanted to briefly mention that to contribute to these discussions at ABC, we have developed a framework um, that seeks to provide recommendations to integrate gender um, to cyber policy, um, both at the national and also in, in international discussions. So really quickly, with, with the project, we try to debunk some misconceptions on gender and cybersecurity. The idea is to not to think gender only as a women's issue, um, because we, we think that incorporating a gender perspective seeks to impact in a positive way to, the, to a lot of groups in situations of vulnerability, and also to impact in a positive way the majority of, of the people is, is not also a technical issue, cybersecurity only. And cybersecurity policies should not be gender neutral, should be, as we propose, be in fact gender aware to, to try to address and tackle these inequalities. Um, so basically a gender approach for us to, to start concluding is about understanding and addressing the differentiated risks, but also the needs faced by complex subjects uh, in the context of cybersecurity. Um, should also recognize the, the importance of, of, of being active subjects um, who have agency in the process of creating a more secure online environment, and also questions and work to overcome this lack of diversity in the cybersecurity field. Um, so again, why is important? Because we think that without the more systemic approach, a human rights and a gender approach to cybersecurity, large segments of the population are left vulnerable to cyber threats. Um, so basically this framework uh, that I can uh, discuss further maybe later in the discussion is thought as a starting point with general recommendations that we recognize should be adapted to regional and national contexts. Uh, it is mainly intended for policymakers working in, in national cybersecurity strategies, but also for the civil society advocating for these perspectives uh, into policies. And also the idea is for this framework to be useful for international discussions. Um, so I, I will stop here for now. Um, I'm happy to share more about this later and, and looking forward to learn more from colleagues and, and to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. Uh, it's indeed quite important to bring a gender perspective to cybersecurity policy, and the lack of diversity in the field is to be tackled. So discussions are indeed numerous from the first committee discussions in, uh, in New York at the UN, as well as the starting negotiations of the Global Digital Compact. Uh, our colleague, uh, Mohamed uh, Farad, has problem connecting, so we will get back to him. I propose to give the floor to uh, Dai Mochinaga. Dai, you have the floor. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I am uh, Dai Mochinaga from Silora Institute of Technology and also affiliated with uh, JPCERT. Uh, I would like to the uh, for stage setting to uh, choose the topic of the economic development and the uh, data protection and these impact of them on the cybersecurity. Uh, from the uh, regional perspective, I would like to point out the uh, fragmentation of the regulation. First of all, the, uh, in the, the big data has the uh, enormous role in economic development recently, and the sharing the data generated by individual companies has uh, created new opportunities for the economic making of economic values. And also, uh, the big data ha is a big uh, both essential for infrastructure and the economy. In order to maximize the economic and the social value generated by such data, it is important to ensure cross-border data flow. However, uh, there are challenges in, the, in security and availability of that data. Uh, cybersecurity becomes a critical issue for our business. It is not only critical infrastructure, but also other business domains. If there is serious impact on the critical infrastructure. It spreads to other sectors and slow down our economic development because trade, finance, people, and data connect to the, the world economy. 
recently countries strengthened the control over data generated and stored in their territories, such as domestic data storage obligations and other restrictions on cross-border transfers, uh, government access, and uh, data sovereignty, which are generally referred as uh, data localization. Data localization have begun to spread internationally in response to these moves uh, from the viewpoints of economic system that rely on data as a source of economic value. On the other hand, uh, cyber attacks or uh, cyber attacks uh, take advantage of the uh, attacking the data. A hospital in Japan was hit by a ransomware. Uh, it's it impacts on the about 85,000 patients' data, and the hospital does not work. So I like to point out that these types of infrastructure, uh, not only critical infrastructure, but also our healthcare system depends on the data. So I like to uh, mention about uh, these types of example is expanding, not only hospital, but also other types of sector. Transportation makes in the Ukraine, Ukraine saved millions of people. And that kind of example shows that cybersecurity saves the people. And uh, the lastly, I'd like to point out the uh, fragmentation of the data regulations. Uh, recently, the Asia-Pacific region has uh, that kind of fragmentation. Each country took a different approach as a uh, as uh, these many reports pointed out. For example, Southeast Asian countries have a different scope or perspectives in cross-border transfer or data localization or regulating the sectors. For example, Vietnam regulates cross-border transfer over personal data, requires data localization for online service. And uh, Thai and Singapore, these countries only regulate the cross-border transfer over personal data. But the Indonesia regulates both uh, and uh, its data localization requires uh, different sectors. So, as I said, uh, da data regulation is now fragmented in this region. This uh, situation uh, is heavily impact on the uh, cybersecurity situation because the cybersecurity service providers collect, store, and data from the computers and the servers. So it uh, it used for the uh, detection or analysis or prevention of the. Uh, uh, service impacts and uh, crowd environments. These types of services depend on the cross-border data transfers. So I'd like to point out these types of situation makes us to secure our inter internet. So I'd like to uh, propose the, uh, point out the uh, primary responsibilities of governments uh, because this session uh, has uh, some kind of these uh, topics. Uh, these kind of governments sh uh, has a responsibility to harmonize these types of regulations along with uh, some kind of principle, uh, setting the principle, uh, something like that. Uh, or I will stop here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dai, for that presentation. It's indeed shedding light on data fragmentation of regulation worldwide and in the Asia Pacific region from Vietnam to Singapore, as you said, as well as concrete use cases and the need for government to harmonize such legislation. Um, we have uh, already online, I see the online moderating, and thanks to Anya uh, for helping out on that, a, a question from the Bangladesh Remote Hub. As a question reads as following, how can individuals raise awareness about online scams and educate others about how to protect themselves. Is there anyone from the speakers that wants to help answer that? Sure, go ahead. Thank you very much for that uh, great question from Bangladesh for the online, uh, is it? Yes, uh, I, I was right, Bangladesh. And it's wonderful that we are communicating virtually across the world. Uh, like I started my remarks 
by reminding everyone that we are in October, which is the month, the UN month of uh, cyber security awareness. And uh, there is a role that each one of us can play to raise awareness, not only on the scams online and uh, those abuses, but also in raising the next generation of uh, responsible citizens who use the most powerful tool on their hands, namely the internet, responsibly by going to talk to school children during their break. You ask their teacher, I want to talk to them about cybersecurity. What is it when somebody that you don't know asks you to tell them about your mother, what you have eaten for lunch today, and all those kind of things. So we expect that uh, uh, as the month of October is advancing, everyone will find their own niche. If it's going to a radio station and talk about technological ways of uh, knowing that this email is not genuine because this is not the kind of uh, 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 address that you expect from a bank. Or showing that these photos have uh, been doctored. <laughs> that is a uh, terminology used nowadays because, you know, uh, with uh, coming of deep fake, it is no longer that a, a picture is just being uh, faked. It is, uh, the word fake is no longer sufficient. It's actually to doctor it, to go so much deep into making it. So kindly look for something that suits your uh, environment in, uh, in, in Bangladesh and make sure uh, October is used effectively to raise awareness on how we can be safe online. Thank you. Thank you indeed. We are in October. Uh, and this is a good moment to actually act on it. So I propose to uh, now open the floor. Uh, we have, as you, as you know, an open floor exchange between speakers and all NRI and interested participants that wants to take the floor on the issue. Uh, and thanks for the speakers from presenting is setting the stage for the discussions and we'll conclude with quick concluding remarks from uh, the speakers and we'll uh, be off to another session. So is there any anyone in the room or online that wants to take the floor? Um, let me check. You can take the floor on the mics um, directly in the room. You have one on the left and one other on the right, and thank you. All right, um, if, if I may, and of course thank you Justice Ali Amani for <laughs> mentioning uh, me and my, my organization during his opening remarks, so I think I should sort of make a quick intervention in, in, in this space. Um, thank you very much, I'm Jeannie from Kaspersky. Um, of course uh, we're a global cybersecurity company. Um, I just wanted to sort of um, pose this question to um, the entire panel. I think um, we're, we're very happy to listen to such esteemed speakers and um, any, it's, it's, it's open for anyone to answer this. I just wanted to know um, what your view is when it comes to partnership between, partnerships between the public and the private sectors. So I'm talking about public-private partnerships. What is the role of um, you know, private companies and, and, and in the industry in this ecosystem to ensure that the fight against cybercrime and in ensuring cybersecurity um, and, and proper, you know, especially in the critical information infrastructure sectors is robust um, and continues to, 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 be, to, to reach out to, to more countries and, and to benefit the regions and internationally as well. The role of public-private partnerships. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wilson Guilherme. I'm from the youth program in Brazil. And I'm a researcher at the Instituto for Researcher on Internet Society, IRIS, in Brazil. We research uh, cybersecurity and we are currently developing research on the protection of infants and the cryptos. But uh, we previously conducted research on government hacking. 
there we have in point to out the risks of you using techniques such as government hacking and decline sign scanning in public security. My recent includes cases of your surveillance from countries in the global north on policies and the activities from the global south. And my questions goes through it this place. How how do build the about cybersecurity from the perspectives of the global south when the north still holds the basis to develop the technologies and the economic power to acquire them? Uh, thank you. Hello. Oh, okay. Hello. Um, my name is Arnaldo. I'm from IF Brazil as well. And um, I followed the previous subscription. Like, we are researching about security and how do we develop a more secure uh, internet to um, safeguard our lives. We from Global South have kind of some measures that are applied by the no global north and especially to the LGBTQI community, we face some difficulties on this theme specifically. So is it possible, my question will be, is it possible for um, us to discuss and implement other perspectives that include and also here's our perspectives on this development. Thank you. Giacomo Mazzone, <coughs> a question for the representative of the Italian IGF. Um, you mentioned about the initiatives for security of elections. I would like to know if there are already examples um, that you have monitored before the next year European elections. Uh, there has been a, a bunch of elections already in Europe this uh, last month uh, in Spain and Slovakia, etc. Have you seen uh, attack, cyber attacks um, on the integrity of the elections? Can you explain what, uh, what you did? Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. Um, you can say a word of presentation, of course, and remarks. And do not hesitate also to take the floor online just for... Is not in the room. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Lucian. Thank you, uh, the, uh, the speakers. I, I have two questions. Uh, uh, number one, I think uh, the, my, my number one question will be inclined to, towards uh, the African Union. Um, we, we have what we call uh, the Malabo Convention um, that took. Uh, you know, place way back in 2014. And of the uh, 55 countries uh, uh, that makes up the African Union, only a few, around 14 or 15, uh, according to what, uh, uh, I, I, according to the data I have, uh, have actually been able to, to ratify the Malabo Convention on Cybersecurity. Uh, my question to the panel is, I mean, what is making uh, countries uh, not being able to, to ratify uh, this very important uh, uh, convention on cybersecurity? And question number two uh, is about uh, the issue of um, uh, as to whether, you know, the, uh, the this, the cybersecurity um, strategies uh, in countries are incompatible with uh, or compatible with what is happening now, given uh, the issues of uh, artificial intelligence, you know, uh, generative uh, AI, um, and where do these two uh, where do these two meet the artificial intelligence and uh, cybersecurity? Thank you. Thank you. Before giving the floor uh, to the, to the on-site uh, room in Kyoto, let me read you a question again from the Bangladesh Remote Hub. 
and thanks you for the question. Uh, second question is how can cybercrime be controlled as so many innocent people are victims across the world, including Bangladesh? Hi. Thank you. Uh, as we know, the cybersecurity and safer internet uh, issues are globally global phenomena. So the actions should be global. So we see that UK, Sri Lanka, kind of uh, local activities and laws, policies are implemented within these countries. So it shows that there is a lack of these uh, issues in the global activities. So uh, I, my first comment is regarding the, uh, that we need to make global actions against the cybersecurity uh, more accurately. Uh, then, second thing is there is roles and responsibilities of users, platforms, technology companies, as well as uh, organizations, civil society. So, uh, advocating on these uh, roles and responsibilities, there is lack uh, of space for those areas. So, my comment is on that. Thank you. Um. Hi everyone, my name is Moho, I'm from Lesotho. I work for Vodacom Lesotho. Uh, I was inspired by the lady from Kapersky um, when she asked her question. So adding on to her question, I want to know um, what advice do you have for countries like Lesotho where the cyber security and cyber crime law has not yet been passed in parliament? So for, co for companies like Vodacom Lesotho, what uh, advice do you have for us to continue making an impactful cybersecurity uh, awareness in our society, even though the law has not yet been passed? Thank you. Thank you. You have the floor. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Igono Oshuke from the Nigeria IGF. I just wanted to uh, pass some comments uh, concerning the questions from my friends here from Brazil and also concerning our uh, our friends from uh, Bangladesh. So there's this question about the Global South and the basis of technology being co uh, all coming from the Global North. So I would like to just point out that uh, at the IGF, just like the structure we have, we're multi-stakeholder and we know we come from a, a bottom-up approach. So uh, I would just say that uh, using an example from Nigeria, what the Nigerian government is doing in conjunction with the private sector, uh, it is very important to take stuff from what you can control and then take it to what you cannot control and that's when you need the global um, intervention. So for Nigeria, for example, we know that we do not have like 100% uh, access to making those changes on a technological level. So we focus on making those changes from a people level and from what we can control. So for example, we looked at, for example, what uh, the speaker said, we look at other areas that are uh, intertwined with cybersecurity, such as sociology, entertainment. So we target the children using uh, animations, using uh, cybersecurity treaties that are child-friendly, uh, using uh, music, using uh, uh, movies, uh, using targeted school uh, programs. So it's taking it from those aspects that we can control. So from the Global South, there's so much resources that we can tap into that intertwined with uh, cybersecurity and we can start to secure our internet from there. And uh, I think that would help us to bridge the gap between what uh, we cannot control from the global north and then over time we take it up to the level such as the IGF and then we can start to have uh, a more concise tech um, focused interventions for cybersecurity. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Just looking around. Uh, in the room, uh, I see no question on the virtual room. Oh, one, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. This is uh, Narayan Temilsina from Nepal. Yeah, as we all know that there is trade-off between usability and security. Uh, uh, the more secure our internet, internet is, less usable they will be and vice versa. Yeah, we all know that. When we talk about data protection, uh, social media regulation, hate speech control, mis dis and malinformation control. Uh, the, we all know that it will, uh, will be less uh, concern about the security uh, concerns and internet uh, freedom uh, is uh, uh, impacted on this part. So my question is how IGF shall deal this issue to achieve the, its principle of internet freedom 
as well as trusted ecosystem achieving and cyber security issues. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the question. I propose to give a round uh, to our colleagues and honorable speakers uh, in the room. Uh, we had a lot of questions, elections, cybersecurity, sharing best practices, new threats such as AI. Who wants to go first? Okay, uh, I'd like to the, uh, try to answer the first question about the uh, private partners, public private partnership. Uh, there are so many public private partnership in, in many countries, but the, these types of work is different scope, has different scope. For example, in Japan, uh, so many companies, especially in the uh, uh, critical infrastructure, holding critical infrastructure, has deeply collaborated with the government about how to secure their infrastructure and not only share information but also sharing the practices and how to how to work with them but the other countries has the uh, some kind of strong regulations about the country has uh, some strong power and they are forcing to regulate these types of infrastructure so the the types of collaboration is different but the goal is the securing cyberspace is common the the biggest Biggest, uh, I think the uh, easy way to success the, uh, these types of collaboration is defining the bad things is a very easy one. For example, cyber crimes. Cyber crimes is bad things. This is a common understanding in global. But the, uh, how to secure cyberspace? What is defining a secure is very different from each country. So public, from the perspective of private partnership, public private partnership, the company has a, what is a good, but government doesn't think it is not bad. So the bad things, for example, stopping or stopping the operation of critical infrastructure is a bad things. But the good things for the private sector is different from the good thing from the government. For example, uh, private sector doesn't want to the interfere with from the government or something like that. So these types of collaboration needs to common understanding about the good things, about the bad things. So this is very difficult things, but the uh, solution is to share that kind of perspectives with the uh, companies and the uh, government sectors. Thank you, Veronica. And do you want to take the floor? Thank you. <clears throat> Um, yeah, sure. Um, there were a lot of like really good questions, um, but I think that some issues that came up are connected also with, with some of the issues we care about when we work on, on cybersecurity issues. So about the questions about like the, the issue of the global majority and the technologies being developed in the global north, um, and also how to engage other actors in the discussions of the laws, for example, in the case of of one of the colleagues that raised the, that issue, talking specifically about companies, but as a civil society speaker, um, the point that I wanted to raise is this idea, also being in the idea of like the symbol of multi-stakeholder participation, is remind us that promoting a safer cyberspace um, is not the responsibility only of states. Um, so a clear and strong commitment to multi-stakeholder holder governance is essential for a safer cybersecurity environment um, at national, regional, and also international levels. Um, so civil society, companies, but also the technical sector, uh, academics, and different state agencies and departments should be involved in cyber policy development. And in particular, we believe that civil society has an important role in, for example, bringing this idea of a human-centric understanding of cybersecurity, and also in helping to implement these approaches. Um, so civil society organizations play a key role in supporting the implementation of norms and policies um, by coordinating and convening other stakeholders to increase the awareness of these policies and norms, to increasing capacity of different actors, um, and also, as 
there were questions about marginalized groups and groups from the global majority. Civil society mobilizes and brings perspectives of these marginalized groups, including excluded communities and grassroots groups, um, and also pushes and advocates for policy processes and legisl the legislative discussions to be more bottom-up, uh, more people-centered and, and more inclusive. Um, in terms of how to do that, how to engage other stakeholders in, in cyber discussions, um, in this framework that I mentioned, we have some concrete recommendations, um, but some basic things are mapping, like doing a, like a mapping of stakeholders um, and like a full range of stakeholders that can be contributing to cybersecurity policies. Um, it's, it's critical to find the voices that can help understand, in particular, the human rights and, and gender aspects in each country um, and in each region. Um, so those were some of the points that I wanted to raise addressing some of the questions. But thanks so much for the questions on the conversation. Thank you. Uh, Giovanni, do you want to go next? Thanks. Yes, there was specifically a question about uh, what has been done in Malta in previous elections uh, yeah, across Europe. Uh, so right now we are working on, um, so the task force has started its activities in the past few months and the first thing that we have been doing is to ask the the hubs that cover the single nation states in Europe and the regions to present a brief overview of the risks um, in their specific country and region and right now we are working on putting together all those inputs and so this is very much a question that probably we will be able to answer comprehensively uh, next month and parallel to that, uh, we've been carrying on an exercise in checking what were the main uh, narratives of disinformation that were circulating uh, in all the states that went to uh, the elections uh, over last year. And we are planning to publish a report about that uh, also very soon. So, um, for example, different countries as have very different narrative uh, narratives of this information that varies a lot b in between them and then you can see that there are a few that are similar across the region so you have this double uh, double path so to say where you can you can see really that uh, the issue of mis and disinformation is both country specific region specific and also uh, overall similar um, across the whole European Union. Uh, aside from that, a quick note on the private-public pub partnership question. Um, I think that there are two main issues here when you want to go into a private-public partnership, uh, and I think those are pretty widespread. So, uh, for example, in Europe, those are more or less one of the common ways to do to business in this field. But there are two issues. One is about independence, and, there's one other, and the other one is about governance. Because um, there is clearly an imbalance of power between uh, the two sectors, in the sense that the private sector usually has the money, and the public sector usually has the regulatory authority. So we have to ensure a governance that makes uh, possible to keep separate these two interests and not uh, influence, <laughs> have a way not to have the money influencing the regulatory authority, so to say. Sorry to put that too brutally, maybe. Uh, finally, on the north-south imbalance, uh, there are, what I find particularly useful is that there are a few, uh, I think, positive examples of uh, cooperation. Uh, for example, I'm quoting again a European example. We've been working with the uh, um, some uh, um, with uh, um, a big uh, African fact-checking organization uh, to carry on uh, an uh, investigation about disinformation narratives uh, in the continent. And the inter is interesting thing there is that we are seeing um, in other parts of the world uh, coming up uh, basically uh, networks of uh, fact-checking organizations that are in some ways um, maybe inspired, modeled, anyway, uh, let's say inspired by the, by the global and European uh, example. So uh, from my point of view, I see a lot of uh, potential in uh, positive collaboration uh, 
in uh, in bringing out the, the best practices. Uh, of course, this is just looking at the positive side. I, kn I know there are also a lot of uh, negative uh, issues around this this topic, but these are just my my two cents about it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Giovanni. It's indeed quite uh, quite an issue, and. Uh, for example, a quick remark, in France we passed a law on combating the manipulation of information in 2018 and well dating back uh, to quite, uh, well, it's an old law, it's 1881, Article 77, if I remember correctly, uh, on, uh, on the topic which is obviously quite an issue since massive campaigns of false information can modify the course of elections. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you a lot. I propose to give the floor last um, to Elia Mani, uh, if you want to react uh, to the different questions. Yes, and thank you very much. Uh, many of them have been answered, but uh, quickly to add to Ginny from Kaspersky. Uh, I know Ginny is uh, working to reach out to some countries, including uh, some African countries. And I'm sure that uh, there are laws in Tanzania, there is the Public-Private Partnership Act of 2015, which explains the parameters in which the private sector can uh, cooperate with the government. and. Uh, areas have been identified. And uh, ICT is one of those areas because uh, most of the infrastructure belong to the private sector, actually. So it is uh, a matter of right that the government needs to collaborate. Uh, very quickly to the young lady from Lesotho. Uh, uh, I think I can be your consultant. <laughs> Invite me to Lesotho and uh, we will discuss. Uh, before I became a judge, I was doing consultancy with different countries on how to develop their Cyber Crimes Act and uh, related laws and conduct workshops. Now that I'm a judge, I don't have that luxury, but uh, if uh, a request comes from the king in Lesotho, who can avoid going, <laughs> or otherwise I can be arrested by the king. Uh, so we'll talk to the Honorable Member of Parliament from Lesotho and we'll see how we can push uh, each other in, in the continent. Uh, the north-south issue has been addressed very quickly, but I can only say that we must push ourselves into the center. We cannot stay and complain and say these issues are from the north and they are uh, 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 putting regulations Get in. There are many, many avenues where the global south can be heard. Only that we cannot sit down and complain and say things are not moving. Eh? In Kiswahili they say, eh, Kama mambo ayaendi nenda wewe. If things are not moving, you move them. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I would like to give a last chance if somebody has a remark or a, a question. Yeah. Go. Um, take the floor, and uh, then we'll uh, give the speakers uh, time to conclude and basically to, well, to point to action points, to try to find what could be good to do, what's next, what could NRIs do. You have the floor. My name is Sajid Latif. I am uh, working for a public sector organization in Pakistan. Uh, we are living, we all are living in global village and, and uh, cyber security is not a local phenomena, it's a global issue. So for, in my point of view, for creating and a, safe, a safer cyber space, a basic set of common regulations should be framed for all countries to follow. Uh, I, I think this will be a very uh, uh, good for all the countries and this will be a common uh, regulation could, you know, easily solve the lot of problems for related to cyber security. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Peter King from Liberia IGF. I would like to ask this question that to date only 39 countries out of 54 in Africa have implemented cyber security legislation. My question is what efforts 
can you suggest or can you make to countries that have strategies that are just in their up like literatures on decks of legislatures in our national you know assemblies what uh, suggestions can you give to to push them to ensure that these laws are made or these are passed to ensure that our safety online issues of cyber crime issues of cyber security are being adhered to from our local perspectives please thank you i take the floor a minute before giving the floor to last colleague we have a third question from Bangladesh, uh, which I read, around 67% uh, of women are victims of violence, harassment, and fraudulent online in Bangladesh. How we can ensure cybersecurity for them, and how IGF can play a significant role in elimination of the problem across the world. <coughs> and now, uh, Sebastien, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Lucien. Sebastien Bachelet from Internet Society France. Um, I, I was in another session where we were talking about the uh, uh, shutdown uh, before, during, and after elections, and uh, there were a question about election. It seems to me that uh, work who could be done at the um, cyber um, action against uh, the trouble before, during, and after election could be a good, good way. But the other point is that uh, it seems to me that uh, we are talking about uh, how to use internet or how internet is closed during election, but we never talk about how we can use internet to help for the election uh, eventually to be used as a tool for election. And uh, for that we need um, cyber uh, tools strong to be able to do that. Maybe you have something to say about uh, this topic. Thank you very much. And maybe I'll... Um, now let's hold a minute. Uh, we are wondering if we could have the hub from Bangladesh uh, speak from, from uh, the remote room to see them on the screen actually. since we are at the Internet Governance Forum in an hybrid session, you know, <laughs> might be a good idea, even if we had some quirk, uh, no end then with uh, digital technologies. So colleagues from Bangladesh, if you, if you want to, to take the floor, you're, you're, you're welcome to do it. Well, uh, we'll see, you, you can still uh, do it. Um, and the, the, the next part, basically we have 15 minutes, which is perfect, um, basically to have our speakers conclude uh, with action points, voluntary commitments, what's next in your mind, what could we do either as individuals or as uh, in collaborating between uh, local and regional internet governance forum, French IGF, Nigeria IGF, Brazil IGF, and so on and so forth. What could we do? Um, how do you feel about it? Who wants to go first? Thank you very much. In concluding, I will take you to the savannas in Africa like I promised to give you hints. So next time you find yourself in the jungle and uh, you don't know how to walk with animals and be safe, these are five secrets of the Maasai people. Number one, carry something taller than you. You will always see the Maasai carrying a, a spear like this. Because animals know the structure of a human being. If you have something different, they will not attack you. 
its application in cyber security always go to Gini and Kapaski and have your cyber security uh, or uh, antivirus or anything to protect you online. If you are not protected, you are vulnerable to all uh, malware and stuff like that. The second secret of the Maasai is to avoid where animals have babies. Or because if you find a very friendly animal, when they are protecting their babies, they will very much attack you. <laughs> and also to avoid where there are watering spots for the animals. In the middle of the Serengeti, if you see some green place, that's where animals drink water. If you go there, they will attack you. Its application in the cybersecurity world, avoid those websites which are not verified. If you get something that you are logic is telling you is not safe, please don't go there. Uh, the third uh, secrets of the Maasai is walk like a Maasai. <laughs> uh, the Maasai have their particular way of walking. They always look confident. If you show online that you are not confident, you will be attacked. And uh, number four secret of the Maasai, tell the truth but not the whole truth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell the truth but not the whole truth. Spare some things. It's application online. Don't share all your data. There are things that you can use to anonymize because uh, those uh, people are looking for your information, and if you give everything, then you will very much uh, uh, be more vulnerable. Uh, lastly, the last, which seems to be very unique to the Maasai people, actually. <laughs> if you are not a Maasai in this room, it's very hard for you to even comprehend. Uh, for us, we talk to things. We don't restrict our wisdom and philosophy to talking to human beings. You can talk to a mountain. You can talk to a tree. You can tell a lion, Mr. Lion, I don't have any trouble with you. Can you allow me to go home? And the lion will actually escort you uh, <laughs> to your place. Um, and this is applicable in the cyberspace also. We need now to be able to interact with machines, machine learning, AI, we, you should know that when you are online there, it's like you have a human being with you. Uh, these things are becoming extremely personal. Throwing away your used computer is like throwing away a part of you. Someone can use that, take it in a forensic lab, and retrieve everything. So make sure that your gap, the gap between you and the online space is as close as possible to, for you to, to be safe. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks, El Yamani, Lal Taika, dear colleague. Um, I would like to give the floor now to uh, Giovanni. Any last remarks, comments, uh, next steps, or reaction to the last questions? Yes, thank you. So uh, from my experience, I would say that one of the uh, the most useful thing is to uh, is collaboration uh, over border across borders and sharing of best practices in sharing what works. So, a very concrete action point is to talk to similar experiences that are doing what you are doing in your country, and see what works with them, and then simply steal it. Uh, this is really uh, something that we have learned from working with the fact-checking community in Europe is that those are pretty similar organizations in terms uh, of uh, how old they are, what they do, the fact that they are usually uh, pretty young staffed, so, and everybody is co constantly trying to find new things, trying to find what works, trying to find what is the best way to teach fact-checking to people, to teach media literacy, and there are a, a ton of best practices of 
good things that work in Spain or in Finland or in the UK. And what, what we do, what I do at least, is I simply try to do the same in my country. So I would say that the simple sharing of information and best practices among similar initiatives is something really concrete, incredibly, incredibly helpful. And on the other hand, I think that we really need to, uh, after the discussion we have today, uh, we really need to, to focus our efforts a lot in uh, media and information literacy, in trying to um, really understand which is the best way to teach people how to make a good use of technology. Because one of the things that strikes me, for example, when you talk, we talk about online fraud or scams, is that those are usually pretty easy thing, things to recognize and to avoid if you know how to do that. So the fact that a large part of the population is still not able to find out an obvious scam uh, when they see it, it is clearly a failure of the way in which we teach how to use those devices, how to use those programs, how to use those websites. So I think we have to collectively to try and find out what is the baseline for teaching uh, media literacy uh, across the world, literally, because there are very few, very simple things that you can do that can actually save you from an online scam. Um, so yeah, those are my main two, two issues, yes. Thanks a lot, uh, Giovanni. Giovanni Zani, uh, director of Pagela Politica. Um, Anya, told, uh, Anya is telling me that our colleagues from Bangladesh might be able to speak now. Let's try. Yeah, thank you, sir, for a nice opportunity to ask. I'm Riyad Hassan Batsha, vice chair of the Bangladesh Youth IJ. Uh, my question is totally youth and women centric right now. This is how we can ensure a cyber, secure cyber space for youth, women, and children. For your kind information, Bangladesh Internet Governance from BIJF is uh, three communities strongly Bangladesh Kids IGF, women, women IGF, and youth IGFs. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Veronica, do we want to go next? Yeah, now it, this working, I think. Um, yeah, sure, I think I just want to build on some of the previous recommendations um, in terms of capacity building and security trainings. I think those are important steps. Um, those initiatives, our recommendation is that they should be specially tailored um, and, and, and built with the groups, these security trainings and capacity building activities um, with the communities they seek to benefit, right? So like not adopting like generic um, security t trainings could be beneficial for certain groups. So this is a, an approach that a lot of organizations uh, implement to, to actually know what are the needs and the risks that these communities you want to, to benefit um, and, and what is actually useful for them. Um, other like really like broad recommendations are more connected with the idea of applying existing agreed norms. You mentioned at the beginning like the um, discussions at the UN and the first committee, so there, uh, there is a framework that should be adopted and also at the national level in, in, in policies regarding cybersecurity. Uh, is more accountability about the implementation of those norms is needed. Um, and international human rights law from a human rights perspective should be the, the guiding framework to any policy or new law connected with cybersecurity, with cybercrime. Um, so basically those were the points that I wanted to, to raise. So the need for really tailored capacity building in terms of cybersecurity, um, understanding the risks and the needs of the groups uh, or, and the communities, um, the need to apply the, the, the norms and the, and the international human rights framework, uh, and also to ensure broad participation of different stakeholders when, when crafting policies and, and also cyber norms discussions at the international level. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. Thank you a lot, Veronica Ferrari, uh, Global Policy Advocate, coordinators from the APC. Um, lastly, I would like to give the floor to Dai Mochinaga. You have the floor. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, I have thinking about the uh, some kind of topics, but the uh, so many topics in this session, so I'd like to just point out one thing. Uh, so, uh, international conferences or the other type of conferences says the uh, for how to how can we uh, level up the uh, capacity building or info sh information sharing. And we continue to discuss about this topic about the, over the decades or decades, but the, I think we need more something new. I think in something new, for example, how can we act after we know about the product practice, after we know some kind of information shared with colleagues or partners? So that kind of action is very difficult for us to act to collaboratively act with act with some partners of the other other organizations is a key things uh, in this in our in our decades. So I think the uh, most point in the future we have to discuss about the things is uh, how can we act based on the information sharing or capacity building. Uh, I'll stop here, thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Moshinaga. Well, we have about one minute left, so let me thank everyone online and on site here in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, merci à toutes et à tous uh, d'avoir été présent. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you all.